Thank you for joining me for this uh, talk on periprosthetic joint infection, a practical approach. This is an issue that I think most every pathologist faces across the United States, is how do I approach the frozen section analysis of revision arthroplasty uh, specimens in a reliable uh, and practical manner that provides the kind of information that the orthopedic surgeon needs to actually approach their patient accordingly. Um, and of course, I wish it was this easy. I wish we could just simply uh, open up Photoshop and fix it. But unfortunately, that's not an option that we have. So I think we need to start with, why are we doing what we're doing? What is the purpose of us providing this information to the orthopedic surgeon? So although it's one of the most successful operations in the United States, that is uh, joint replacement therapy, uh, they do ultimately fail. And when they fail, uh, the surgeon often wants to know whether this is due to aseptic loosening or is there an infective process, an infectious process that has caused uh, this failure. And the reason they want to know that is because they have different options for surgery. So what, what do they do? If, if, if we suggest that the revision arthroplasty specimen we're looking at is infected, the surgeon has a few different options. Well, one, they could debride it and keep the prosthesis intact, prosthesis retention, okay? Two, they can do a resection arthroplasty with reimplantation. That can be done in one or two stages. In the United States, it's much more common to use a two-stage surgery that involves a joint spacer with antibiotic therapy, usually around four to six weeks. Uh, debridement and reimplantation occurs when the infection is considered controlled. Um, for a third option could be resection arthroplasty with no reimplant, and a fourth, an unfortunate option, and usually this is the option that's reserved for uh, cases that are completely resistant uh, to antibiotic therapy, or there have already been multiple revisions at, that were unsuccessful, and that is amputation. And just to look at this in another way, periprosthetic joint infection, this is just sort of to show you a little bit of an algorithm of why they need to know what we think at frozen section. Just a different way of looking at it. So antibiotic spacers, what are these? Well, these are methods by which the orthopedic surgeon can use orthopedic implants to deliver uh, antibiotic therapy. And there are a whole variety of these types of spacers that can be utilized. There are static ones where the, the limb becomes fixed, mobile or dynamic ones, and there's even mold injected types. But again, this is one of the reasons why in the United States, the orthopedic surgeon wants to know your opinion at frozen section, and ultimately on permanent sections as well. So, you know, the idea that we could provide information that would be helpful for uh, determining uh, the, uh, whether or not a re joint replacement was infected um, has been looked at for quite some time. And there have been a variety of articles and there was a sort of a blitzkrieg of these types of articles during the late or mid to late 1990s. Uh, ultimately, we decided at least somewhat arbitrarily that five or more neutrophils in five or more high power fields would be uh, where we would rest our criteria. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but there's no shortage of articles on this topic that attempted to correlate uh, the presence of neutrophils in, in, in the revision arthroplasty tissues with cultures and, of course, the clinical response of the individual patient. Now, it's also important for you as a pathologist to understand that you are part of a much bigger puzzle. And unfortunately, I think some orthopedic surgeons don't practice this quite the way it was intended to be practiced. What it was intended to be was that your examination of, of the revision arthroplasty specimen and your histologic uh, diagnosis was part of a minor uh, list of minor criteria by which the orthopedic surgeon would determine uh, whether or not this uh, a, a periprosthetic, periprosthetic tissue was in fact infected. Um, the major minor criteria were somewhat of a joint effort between the Musculoskeletal Infectious uh, Infection Society and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons to provide at least an algorithmic type of response to how to determine infection. Because we know that the histology alone is not sufficient uh, to make that diagnosis. So there's a list of major and minor criteria. On the major side, we have two or more 
periprosthetic cultures with essentially the same organism identified. So if you, if the orthopedic surgeon obtains that, uh, that alone is considered enough to define periprosthetic joint infection. If there's a sinus tract communicating with a joint, that alone is considered enough uh, to define periprosthetic joint infection. In fact, we still receive these types of specimens at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and generally speaking, these are not specimens that, are, that we see at the frozen section table. These are instead uh, uh, specimens that we see on permanence. And almost always uh, the, the criteria are easily met. And of course, there's definitely histologic evidence of infection. Now, if, if, those, if either of those criteria are not met, then we move to the minor criteria. And to establish a, a diagnosis of infection among the minor uh, criteria, we need three or more of the following. And I'll, I'll just point out a few things. Notice that CRP and erythrocyte sedimentation rate are together as one minor criteria. They're not separate. Uh, other features are increased amounts of white blood cells within the synovial fluid or the percentage of PMNs within synovial fluid. And of course, you see the fourth one is what we do, our histological analysis of periprosthetic tissue. And the fifth is a single positive culture. So uh, in the absence of, of one of the major criteria, technically speaking, the surgeon needs three or more of the minor criteria to establish a periprosthetic joint infection. So you're part of that puzzle and not the whole puzzle. That's important for you to understand. Now, in terms of looking at histologic features, I've illustrated this slide this way uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that there are histolo histologic features we'll talk about that are associated with aseptic loosening and wear, uh, wear debris of that um, uh, that occurs as a result of having that foreign body inside of an individual, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about it. Um, on the other side of the coin, is the periprosthetic joint infection where we're talking about seeing neutrophilic infiltrates. In general, the more aseptic loosening histologic features you see, the less likely it is to be infected. And of course, the converse is true. But I've drawn these as two circles that overlap to illustrate the point that there in fact is overlap here and don't, uh, don't necessarily uh, blow off a case that looks like mostly aseptic loosening because you're not seeing areas devoid of these sheets of granular histiocytes. Now, I'll illustrate this more in a moment just to show you what we're talking about. So there's a term that I use, and I adopted this term uh, from my mentor, Dr. Chris Uni at the Mayo Clinic, who used an encompassing term called arthroplasty effect to describe uh, the release of particles, the wear over time of particles from a joint uh, implant into the adjacent tissues and, of course, their response to that wear debris. Uh, on the left-hand side over here, you see these kind of foamy to granular histiocytes. And if I, I'm going to show you that what this looks like with polarization in a moment, but th this is all uh, polyethylene debris, kind of plastic type debris that's in these histiocytes. This can be kind of granular or it may form uh, shards, which are clearly visible by light microscopy and are surrounded by histiocytic giant cell reaction. In addition to that, depending upon uh, whether there's metal and the type of metal that's present, you may also get small amounts of particulate metallic debris, like you see this dark black debris representing titanium that also shows up in histiocytes. If you polarize this type of debris, um, of course, the metallic debris doesn't polarize, but the polyethylene debris actually does, and it's very strongly birefringent. And you can see all the variation in size and shape of these individual particles. Some of it would be clearly identifiable at light microscopy, and others would be not. Um, if we go back over here to the light microscopy H&E stain, you'll notice that there's a very strong histiocytic giant cell reaction. And I will tell you that on occasion, you'll even see a granulomatous response with frank, well-formed granuloma. So if you see that process occurring in a patient under revision arthroplasty, don't let it alarm you. You can quickly polarize it and you'll notice that there's at least some polarizable material that should be present uh, within those areas. Now, in, in terms of where we look for periprosthetic joint infection, um, first of all, I tend to like to concentrate on that interface of fibrin and soft tissue, which is the periprosthetic membrane. It's the best place to find 
uh, neutrophils if they're present. And again, it's usually away from areas that are showing a lot of that arthroplasty wear debris. And you can see that here, up here in the this uh, on the on this right the picture on the left side, the sort of right corner is fibrin. Here's this kind of loose granulation tissue type process. And within that at higher power, you see lots and lots of neutrophils present. This is the area of highest yield. So when I'm looking at one of uh, at, at a, a revision arthroplasty of frozen, you know, obviously I don't have time to spend at 40X going through looking through the entire specimen. So I focus on areas where I'm most likely to find it. Moving away from the areas of arthroplasty of effect and granular histiocytic uh, 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 response and into these areas at this periprosthetic membrane fibrin soft tissue interface is where is one of the best areas to look for. Um, this is just a little bit higher power showing the fibrin and again the tissue and sometimes it can be a little bit hard to tell but usually once that tissue becomes solid and you start to see blood vessels with it you can be fairly certain that that's not fibrin that that's actually the tissue and neutrophils count in those areas uh, other areas i'll look for if i find granulation tissue like areas that are present um, i will look for that so looser areas less densely fibrous can also be a high yield type of area um, and I need to point out that there are some uh, pitfalls in this whole process uh, that you need to ignore. The most obvious pitfall, and probably the one most people are familiar with, is that neutrophils and fibrin don't count. Now, having said that, in real life practice, the reality of it is, is, is if I see abscess-like quantities of neutrophils that are within fibrin, if I see that type of, of abnormality, while it is not suggest while it's not consistent with periprosthetic joint infection and no not necessarily suggestive it does make me look harder within tissues because um a number of us uh that look at these uh, every day um in our, our practice have noted that when you see a lot of neutrophils in fibrin more than average that is a clue that you need to pay a little closer attention to soft tissue. But by itself, if that's the only place you're seeing neutrophils, that is not sufficient. That doesn't meet this logic criteria. Also, it's not uncommon to see lymphocytes that look a little bit lobulated. And you particularly seem to notice this more at frozen, it seems like, than permanents. Those don't count. If you don't see a definite neutrophil, it doesn't count. If you see intravascular neutrophils or neutrophils lining the vessel walls, those don't count as part of the histologic criteria for periprosthetic joint infection. Um, I will also tell you to be especially um, careful of neutrophils associated with bone marrow. So when you get fragments of bone and you see a very cellular areas, make sure you're not looking at bone marrow because that's, that's an easy pitfall for overcalling periprosthetic joint infection. Neutrophils in the setting of inflammatory arthropathies, if, if you find uh, that this is a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, be careful. Uh, if they've got active disease, you may also see neutrophils in there. And so I've, I'll back off on those rare occasions. Another pitfall that I, I saw recently was um, gout or gouty tophi showing up in revision arthroplasty. It's not uncommon um, to see gouty tophi. Well, I should say it's, it's, it, it is uncommon to see gouty tophi show up in periprosthetic joint infection. But when you do as much as we do, you will see it. Uh, your body hates gout, hates gout crystals, hates, hates uric acid crystals. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, uh, elicits a very strong, not just histiocytic uh, joint uh, type response, but also can be neutrophilic. In fact, it's not uncommon to see acute osteomyelitis associated with gout. So if you see those types of crystals, I back off a little bit. I give myself a little bit of rope in defining whether this is actually periprosthetic joint infection. Now, I need to mention uh, uh, one uh, important uh, new antimicrobial test that is available to help in defining periprosthetic joint infection. That's alpha defensin, also known as Synovasur. Uh, this is a, a, um, a peptide that can be detected in synovial fluid and can be a fairly powerful predictor of periprosthetic joint infection. And these are slides I should say that I got from my colleague, Dr. John Reith. Um, that, that basically provide some information on uh, this uh, type of test. Um, there have been a number of articles um, that have talked about this test uh, as it being a sensitive and specific predictor of periprosthetic joint infection. It hasn't ended our role 
as pathologists in evaluating the uh, uh, revision arthroplasty specimens, but it can also be an adjunct to that in helping the orthopedic surgeon define infection. And it seems to be particularly useful in two settings, in patients who have some sort of systemic inflammatory disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and in patients who have been previously treated with antibiotics. So I just want to make sure uh, that we at least cover uh, this topic. Okay, so let's end this discussion by uh, talking about the following. You've looked at the um, uh, these revision arthroplasty specimens at frozen. So now what do you say? Okay, so we're going to reiterate some of the, the things we've already talked about. First of all, as I said before, if you are not totally sure, don't call it. You're looking at, remember at frozen sections, you're looking at oftentimes a slightly uh, thicker slide. Be careful of lobulated lymphocytes. I don't know if, if it's just me or not, but it seems like that I never see as many neutrophils on permanence as I saw in frozen section. So be very careful. And if you're not sure, don't call it. Again, I mentioned this. I scan the slide. I look for loose or cellular areas. I concentrate on that periprosthetic membrane area, that interface of tissue with fibrin, but don't count the fibrin. If there's a lot of neutrophils in the fibrin, that may suggest infection, but they only count if they're actually in tissue. Very, very important point. I've seen this happen on a number of occasions where colleagues of mine called neutrophils. Yes, it met the criteria. It was greater than five neutrophils for greater than five or more high power fields, but it was bone marrow they were looking at. So it doesn't mean infection. Be very cautious of that. Equivocal cases, yeah, do I check the lab data, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or CRP, or even uh, alpha defensin? Of course, um, it can sometimes be helpful, but remember that your histologic diagnosis stands by itself. Don't make your diagnosis based on the lab data. It may help you move in one direction or another, but you stand alone with your histologic diagnosis. Um, as far as what I say in the report, I don't put the word infection in my frozen section report. I do in the permanence, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But remember that you are reporting a minor criterion, right? not consistent with infection at this point. You're just giving them uh, some information on this. So at frozen section, I will say negative four significant, very important word, acute inflammation, or simply significant acute inflammation, or if you, or if you want positive for significant acute inflammation. Either way, I use the word significant to imply that I either do or I don't see five or more neutrophils in five or more separate high power fields, right? I could see a rare neutrophil, right? but that doesn't make it significant. So this is all I say in the frozen section. The only difference between this and, and, and what I say in the final report is that in the final report, I will say significant acute inflammation suggestive of periprosthetic joint infection. And I say that the way I say it again, emphasizing that I am a part of the entire algorithm and puzzle that defines periprosthetic joint infection. I'm not the defining piece of that. Very important uh, to remember that. So again, thank you for your time. I hope you found this uh, lecture on periprosthetic joint infections helpful. Thanks again.